Tonight, tidings from the east and the mark of the beast. We've had this conflict with Islam. King of the south, Islam comes from the south. Christianity comes from the north. Jerusalem gets caught in the middle, and God's people get caught in the middle. We have the Crusades, the Ottomans, and the time of the end. There is kind of a graph of it over time, and the black line is the Muslim power curve, and the red line is the papal power curve. Papal led Christianity north. They're the ones that call for the Crusades, and on down the line. In our last presentation, we talked about this number three, and how we are already in the third and final time of the end conflict. It is still intensifying, and the stuff that you're watching happening around you right now is a part of it. But radical Islam goes down. Moderate Islam follows papal-led Christianity. But there is a small group of Muslims and a small group of Christians that unite together to share in the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time, right on the backside of this. You see, this fight between the king of the north and the king of the south is not your fight if you're on God's side. Your fight is the fight to save people for Jesus Christ, to love people for Jesus Christ. And when this battle ends, radical Islam is gone. Moderate Islam is pretending to be following papal-led Christianity. And that's going to give God's people that are truly following him from that come out of Islam and out of the Christian world, a wide open opportunity because the world's been turned upside down. People are looking for answers and we can point out, look, we just went through exactly what the Bible said was going to happen. The Bible's real, Jesus is real, and a lot of people will be accepting him. And the king of the north will not be happy because he wanted them to follow him. Let's take a look at some things. Verses 44 and 45 are the last moments of the King of the North of the Papal Alliance. It comes to its end at the end of verse 45. So that'll be the end of Papal-led Christianity. Let's read them. But news from the East and the North shall trouble him. Again, the hymn is King of the North, Papal-led Christianity. Therefore, he, the king of the north, will go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many, and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. The whole world was following them, him, but all of a sudden nobody helps him. All right, let's unpack a few things. What is tidings from the east and what is tidings from the north? Well, Ezekiel, a contemporary of Daniel, uh, says this. Afterwards, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. I want you to notice, when the message from the east comes, the earth shines with glory. That's important because you're going to see the same idea in the book of Revelation. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And from that moment on, Jerusalem became the target. Oh, if God said, I'm going to put my throne in Jerusalem, where does Satan want his? In Jerusalem. And so the king of the north and the king of the south both want their throne there. But remember, Satan's got a house divided. Satan's behind both the king of the north and the king of the south. They're both using force and fear to get their way. Whenever somebody uses coercion, politically or militarily, to get their way, I know it's not really of God. Well, anyway, it goes on. No more shall the house of Israel defile my holy name, they nor their kings by the harlotry. They defiled my holy name by the abominations which they committed, Therefore, I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put their harlotry and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. So it is a message that makes the earth glow, and it's a warning against spiritual adultery or falsehoods. Chapter 44, the message from the north. Also, he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. So I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. You've got the glory again, don't we? 
just like the other one. Now say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, let us have no more of all your abominations. So it's a warning against abominations and falsehoods again. In Revelation, we have a message from the east. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So just before Jesus comes again, there is this sealing work done by the Holy Spirit preparing his people. But that's from the east. God's preparing his people. But in Revel or Daniel 11, God's preparing his remnant out of Islam from the east, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. The east is the direction of Jesus' return. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now look at Revelation 18. It doesn't say which direction, but it combines the ideas of Ezekiel's tidings from the east and tidings from the north. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. That's just like Ezekiel 43 and 44, the east and the north. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, has become a dwelling of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And so, when God combines the terminology of the east and the north, we have this message that fills the earth with glory, and it is a preparation for the closing events. And what does he have to do to prepare us? He has to take the false teachings that papal-led Christianity has brought into Christianity and clean us up and get us back on track so we're able to follow him legitimately. So they're truly connected to him and the Holy Spirit power, not the human traditions. And what's amazing, in Daniel 11, the last two verses, going in the verse 12, 1, 2, and 3, it goes through one point after another that the papal system has, an, has corrupted to bring it back in the line. It tells us what they are, and we'll unpack them as we go. So tidings from, the summary for this, tidings from the east and the north, just before the destruction of the king of the north, which is the beast, the papacy, God sends a warning message to get away from it and all of its abominations. I mean, if you were God and you were about to destroy a group, would you try and get your people out of the group first? No kidding. And God has huge numbers of people in the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Adventist Church, and the Islam, and all this, and he's going to pull all of them together to fully serve Jesus in the Bible. Now, everything in Daniel is both geopolitical and spiritual. You can map it on the map of what's happening, but it's also applying globally in a religious way, all right? You have Israel and Western Jordan side by side. And it's a relatively friendly border. But what you also have in the Bible, religiously, Israel represents God's people of faith. And so there are people from within Jewish people that are truly turning to Jesus Christ. And you have from Edom, Moab, and Ammon, that's that group within Islam we talked about yesterday that's joining with God's people of faith. They're following Jesus in the Bible. And out of the north, out of Babylon, the original king of the north, when John uses the term Babylon. He's talking about the king of the north. God calls a remnant out of there. Notice God's pulling his remnant together into his Israel of faith. And they're going to be proclaiming, you don't follow the king of the south. You don't follow the king of the north. You follow Jesus and his word, the Bible. And it's going to get the king of the north really mad. Because he's conquered radical Islam, moderate Islam, and the rest of the world are following him, except for those ordinary fundamental Christians that are following Jesus in the Bible. 
I want to be one of those people that are lovingly following Jesus in the Bible. Some people may not like it. King of the North may call it stubborn. Yeah, I intend to be stubborn. I'm not going to give up on Jesus in the Bible no matter what they say. Does that make sense? hope it does. I hope you're willing to say the same thing. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Oh, let's see. If all the world is following him, that means the only people that aren't following him are in the Lamb's book of life at this point. And if he goes out to destroy and annihilate people, do you think it's going to be those that are following him or those that are in the Lamb's book of life? Pretty obvious it's after the Lamb's book of life, after God's people. And so that's what he goes to do. Take a look at Revelation, some very similar words. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. By the way, if I was the devil and this last third and final conflict between Islam and papal-led Christianity has begun, I would know that I have a what? A short time because it's the time of the end whirlwind, according to Daniel 11. And so, yep, he knows that he has a short time. When he has a short time, is it likely to get easier or harder for God's people in the middle? Harder. Uh, think about a Super Bowl game. At the two-minute warning, if the score is close, is it going to get gentle on the field or really rough? Really rough. If in the next couple of weeks, the campaign gets really close, do you think it's going to get really kind in the presidential campaign? Uh-uh. It's already gotten pretty rough. It could get a lot rougher still. Who knows what can yet happen in the next couple of weeks. And so that's the same way it is here. He goes out to destroy and annihilate many. Look at what it says in Revelation 13. And he deceived those who dwell on earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. <laughs> if somebody's out to kill you, is that about the same as annihilating you? Yeah. He causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast. Hey, if somebody takes away your bank account and all those kind of things, do you think they're trying to destroy you? So annihilate in Daniel, kill in Revelation, not buy and sell in Revelation, destroy in Daniel. The same thing. And so what we're talking about is the same thing that happens at the time of the mark of the beast. Everybody has to choose. You either get the seal of God in the forehead or you get the mark of the beast in the forehead or the hand. Tell you what, I want the seal of God. That's what I want to focus on. And if you get the seal of God, you don't get the mark of the beast. So that's a definite good thing. But everybody has to make the choice. And you don't want the mark of the beast. You really don't, folks. Revelation 14 makes that really clear. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. I don't know exactly what the mark of the beast might be like or the seal of God. My artist went and used a branding iron for 666. I doubt it. Some people think it might be a tattoo. Some people think it's a chip. Some of us don't think it's any of those things. Yeah, you heard me saying it's probably not one of those things. Why? The seal of God is when I make the decision to follow Jesus Christ, no matter what. The mark of the beast is when I believe, mark of the beast in the forehead, if I believe that the beast system, the king of the north system is right. Mark of the beast in the hand, I know the system isn't right, but I'm just going to go along with the crowd to avoid trouble. I want you to notice something. You can believe or just go along the crowd to be lost, but you have to believe to be saved. You cannot just go along with the crowd to be saved. You've got to make your own decision for Jesus Christ. You've got to trust in Jesus Christ for yourself. You can't go along with the crowd to be saved.
I hope you're making that decision for yourself. Now, could they use technology? Oh yeah, they'll probably use the best technology they can at any given moment. However, all you have to do is have an electronic pulse weapon go off and all that electronic stuff stops working in an area. And if there is a good old fashioned solar storm, they had one in the 1840s, that if we had one like it today, most computers and most cars would stop working. Just a good old fashioned solar storm. So God could pretty much put us back to the Stone Age just with a flash of radiation from the sun. Knocking out all those computers. That would be both good and bad, wouldn't it? But if you had a solar storm that knocked out the computer networks and your own computer, where did all your financial records just go? Yee! Scary thought, isn't it? This world could go into chaos so fast. I believe they will use the best technology they have, and it could be a chip or it could be a simple with all technology gone. Do you agree with the system or not? And if you say no, you can't buy and sell. If you say yes, you can. Uh, it can get pretty simple. You wear a mask and you get service. You don't wear a mask, you don't get service. Huh. We're getting practice, aren't we? I'm not saying the mask is a mark of a beast at all, but I'm just saying there are similarities and we're getting practice. Uh, the mask is not a religious issue on who you worship. Now, not everybody will agree with me in what I find when I search what the Bible says is the seal of God and the mark of the beast. But friends, I'm going to share what I find. And you can get a concordance. And those of you who attend eight of the ten presentations can get a concordance for free, remember? Here's what I find when I look up the sign or seal. Both a sign or a seal are the same thing, interchangeable. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Notice the Sabbath is a sign, God's sign, his seal, that he sanctifies us. Do you know what it means to be sanctified? It means to be made holy. When God sanctifies something, he makes it holy. And so the Sabbath is a sign that he makes me holy. Can I make me holy? As a sinner, can I make myself holy? No. I could maybe try to stop sinning, and I could get even really proud that I'm better than everybody else, and that would be a sin all by itself. Once I'm a sinner, I can't fix it. The only way I can become holy is if God makes me holy, and the Sabbath doesn't make me holy. It's a sign that God makes me holy. All right? Here's another one. Exodus 31, surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. There it is again. God puts it in the Bible many times. We're going to find the same ideas in the New Testament. You see, a seal, when somebody in the ancient times had a signet ring, a seal, they would push it into clay or wax, and it would leave a and there is sort of insignia in it, and it would tell them their name, their title, and their territory, like Donald Trump, President, United States of America. All right? Now, where does that show up? It was put into legal documents and stuff, and it shows up right in the middle of Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. It's in the Sabbath commandment. Remember, the Sabbath is the one he calls his sign that he makes us holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Oh, there's something about being holy here. The Sabbath was made holy on the seventh day of the week at creation. The Sabbath didn't do anything to be made holy. God made it holy. It was an ordinary day that God made holy. The Sabbath is a sign that God can take an ordinary sinner and make us holy, like he did that day. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. There's a name-title combination. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Keep that underlined section in mind because it shows up in Revelation in a very interesting place. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He made it holy. Just like he can make you and I holy. When Satan knows he has a short time, guess who he goes after? That was Revelation 12, 12. Now we're down to verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. The woman is God's people. If she's a pure woman, she's God's pure people. If she's an adulterous woman, she's a God's people that have gone bad. All right? A fallen Christian. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring down at the end of time who keep, who keep what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Are they saved by perfectly obedience? No. They're saved by trusting in Jesus. But as a result, they're sanctified, they're made holy, and then they keep the commandments. Huh. So Satan has it out for somebody who loves Jesus enough to be changed and follow the commandments. That's what he gets really, really mad at. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Over and over, God's last day people are keeping the commandments because they're trusting in Jesus. Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Oh, that's right now, folks. Tomorrow night we're going to see that the judgment is now. And he worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Just before the mark of the beast, there is a message that comes out. Fear God, give glory to him, because his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven, the earth, the sea, and springs of water. Remember, that's out of the fourth commandment. And Satan doesn't want God's people keeping the commandments. And here's a reminder to the commandment that said, remember. Now, some people tell me, you know, keeping the commandments would be a burden. <laughs> but the Bible says something very different. And this is love for God, to obey his commandments, to, and his commandments are not burdensome. You see, I actually think that not keeping God's commandments is a burden. How do I, why do I think that? Well, if you lie, you've got to remember what lie you told the who. And your life now becomes more complicated. If you're having an affair, oh, your life could get really complicated. Uh, there was a man I knew in a city that I lived. Thankfully, he was not one of my church members, but he was a leader in a neighboring church in the town where I pastored. I knew him quite well, been involved in several projects with him. And my wife and I were on a, our way home from vacation, and we stopped about two or three hours away from home and ate out on our way home in a, in a Olive Garden restaurant. And while I'm sitting there waiting for my food, or maybe I already had it, but I was sitting at the table, and I see this man walk into the restaurant with his arm around a lady. I know both he and his wife, and that is not his wife. But he thought he was two or three hours away from home, and he could do this. And as he walks just past my table, literally close enough for me to reach out and touch him, I looked at him, and I said, Hi, what brings you here? Do you know, my presence suddenly became a burden to him. His arm fell away from that lady really, really fast, and he started mumbling something about business. Hmm, serious business is what I'm thinking. <sighs> you know, I saw him a couple of days later in town, and he tried to avoid me. Like he had some kind of burden in his life. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you follow God's commandment, there's nothing you need to hide from. You don't have to have a guilty conscience. I like being free. And when I do blow it, I like asking forgiveness and being forgiven so I can be free again. 
But yeah, it's not a burden following God's commandments, a burden when you don't. Somebody says, well, was the Sabbath ever changed? Well, it was the seventh-day Sabbath to start out with. But you know, in the Bible, it was never changed. Let's take a look back in the New Testament church. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. This is written by Luke. Luke is the Gentile educated guy, the Gentile physician. And if anybody's going to tell us how the day of worship was changed from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day Sunday, for the Gentiles, it should have been Dr. Luke. But instead, he talks more about the Bible Sabbath being kept by the New Testament church than anybody else does. And so what we have here is both Jews and Gentiles worshiping together on Sabbath. And on the next Sabbath, it was a big group of Jew and Gentile. Interesting. If the Bible had, or Jesus had changed the Sabbath, they would have said, you don't need to come back next Sabbath, just show up tomorrow on Sunday because that's the day of worship for the Gentiles. Didn't say that. It said, Gentiles, come back next Sabbath. Now, let's go over to Acts chapter 18, another city. And he, Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Well, if he reasoned every Sabbath for a year and six months, you know, that's 70-some Sabbaths in a row kept by Gentile Christians in, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. After some of the disciples were already dead, so it's very clear in the New Testament, they didn't know about any change yet. And Isaiah actually says there's going to be the Sabbath still being kept in heaven. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, and from one Sabbath to another all flesh shall come to worship me, says the Lord. Oh, so in the new heavens and new earth there's a Sabbath. Jesus was asked about the law and he says, as long as heaven and earth exist, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law. I've got a question. Is there earth under your feet? Yeah. There's still an earth here, isn't it? Then God's law is still there. And in the new heavens and the new earth, the Sabbath is still there too. So it's not done away with yet. Then Luke. Again, Dr. Luke. Some people say, but how do I know when the biblical seventh day is? It, could the biblical seventh day like be on Tuesday or something now? Could it have been all messed up? How do I know what day is the biblical seventh day? Well, Luke answers that one very nicely, too. It's the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus in Luke 23 and 24. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. You see, the Jews name the days of the week this way, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, preparation day, and the Sabbath. This is a preparation day, the day we would call Friday, and the Sabbath drew near. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Praise the Lord, the stone was gone because Jesus had been resurrected, right? Thus indicating that he had won over death and sin. He is now fully able to sanctify us. Does that mean the Sabbath is done away with? Or would that make it even more important? Well, let's take a look at this. Jesus dies on the preparation day, according to Luke. Often called Good Friday by people today, right? On the resurrection weekend, people call it Good Friday. He rests in the tomb according to the Sabbath, and he's resurrected early in the morning before sunrise on the first day of the week, often called Easter Sunday. So all you have to do to figure out where the Bible Sabbath is, is to figure out what day comes between Friday and Sunday. That's not that difficult, is it? And if Christians to this day are celebrating Easter weekend with a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection, the Sabbath has to be the day between those two. 
And people say, oh, but what about the Jews? They haven't lost track of Sabbath day all the way through. It's still what we call Saturday. What is the name for Saturday in Spanish? Somebody's got to know the name of Saturday in Spanish, right? Sabado. It's a form of the word Sabbath. In half the languages on this planet, the name of the seventh day of the week is a form of the word Sabbath. That just gives you a little history linguistically of what has been the seventh day Sabbath. It's no question. Also, it says first day, right? In the Greek Bible, it doesn't exactly say first day of the week. It says first from the Sabbath, second from the Sabbath, third from the Sabbath, fourth from the Sabbath, fifth from the Sabbath, preparation for the Sabbath and the Sabbath. Even in Greek, the names of the week, of the days of the week, are a reference to the Sabbath. There are just so many things here. At creation, Jesus says it is finished and he rested on the Sabbath. On the cross, he says it's finished and he rested on the Sabbath and got up to give us the gifts as our high priest to mediate the gifts of his forgiveness to make us holy, to sanctify us. You see, he's the one that made it in the beginning and he resets it by resting on it again after he says it's finished. Just so many things there. Look what Martin Luther said. For he, Jesus, died at about 2 o'clock on Friday and consequently was dead for about two hours on the first day. That night he lay in the grave all day, which is the true Sabbath. On the third day, which we commemorate now, he rose from the dead. Now he's saying the seventh day of the week, that Saturday, is the true Sabbath. That bothered Melanchthon so much, one of his right-hand help, scholarly helpers, that Melanchthon began keeping the Sabbath. Hebrews 4.4, 4. what's the meaning of the Sabbath? <laughs> surprise, surprise, it's the same as the Old Testament. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest himself has ceased from his works as God did from his. Friends, get this. Can my works save me? No. Can my works cause me to be lost? Yes. The wages of sin is death. So do I want to say, hey, I want to trust in my works? Nope. Don't want to do that. So I'm going to rest from my works and trust in God's works to make me holy. Get this. The Sabbath is a day that you don't do your regular works. It is a sign that you're resting from your religious works and trusting in his works. And if you want to be determined to work your way into heaven, <laughs> it doesn't work. You have to rest your way into heaven. You rest from your works and his works. I do believe in being saved by works. I'm going to be saved by Jesus' works when I rest in his works. Never saved by my works. And the Sabbath is an indicator. God took an ordinary day and he sanctified it as a symbol that he can take an ordinary sinner and sanctify us. You know, when I think about that Sabbath commandment to rest, I can remember uh, working in construction and other things. And there were some interesting things when I would tell people I wouldn't work on the seventh-day Sabbath. You know, you could have somebody just flat out tell you, if you're not here, you're not working here. And I would just simply say, you know, I can't because God asked me not to. You see, if somebody tells me I have to be there and work on God's Sabbath day and God said the rest on it, and if I work, who am I trusting? God or myself? trusting myself and my works get me in trouble but if I trust in God and rest then I might get fired from my job but it's God's problem to take care of me did you catch that 
Resting is trusting in God. Working is trusting in self. People say, oh, you're trying to keep the Sabbath. You're trying to work your way to heaven. No, I'm not. I'm resting in God's works. I trust him. I'm not working my way to heaven. I'm resting my way there. Resting in God's works. And that gives peace to my soul. Well, somebody says that God's law has been abolished, right? No. Paul said it this way in Romans 3.31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. As long as I was trying to work my way to heaven, it would never work. But now that I trust in Jesus and I rest in him and distrust in him, now it'll work because he has the ability to do it that I don't have. Well, we looked at God's side. What about the beast side? Well, remember in presentation two, the eighth characteristic, that the papacy, the little horn, king of the north, beast power, would think it could change times and laws and would fight against God's covenant or his law. Well, they claim they could do it. Remember this one? Catholic Ferrari's Ecclesiastical Dictionary. The Pope is of so great of authority and power that he can modify, change, or interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God, and he acts as vicegerent of God upon earth with most ample power of binding and loosing his sheep. They claim they can change God's law, but God said, Jesus said, his law will not change, not one jot or tittle. God said he won't change. Huh. They say they can change it. I'm going to stick with the Bible. Catholic Catechism. Question, which day is the Sabbath? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Did you notice they didn't say Jesus did it? They didn't say God did it. They didn't say the disciples did it. They said they did it. That's why I can't follow it. I can't follow a tradition of people over the word of God. You have to figure out what you're going to do, but I hope you're going to follow God's word. St. Catherine's Church, Catholic Church in Algonac, Michigan. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. The day the Lord has chosen not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. The day of resurrection, the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, came on the first day of the week. So this would be the new Sabbath. Did you notice they did it from a sense of their own power? It goes on to say something that's not quite true completely. It's partially true. Here's what he goes on to say. People who think that the scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. Logically, you should keep the Sabbath holy to me if you claim to follow the Bible and the Bible only. However, there are many groups other than Seventh-day Adventists that also keep the Bible Sabbath. There's a tremendous amount of them. It's just the Seventh-day Adventist church happens to be the largest of those groups by far. We're somewhere around 20 plus million. Uh, that are Seventh-day Adventists around the world. Continuing, in the book Faith of Millions, another Catholic writer, John O'Brien, but since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course, it's inconsistent, but the change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. They've continued to observe custom even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance remains the reminder of the Mother Church from which non-Catholic sects broke away. E, interesting wording from a Catholic writer. Because in Revelation, it calls Babylon the mother of harlots. The, and the Catholic Church calls itself the Mother Church. And they say everybody who follows them on the Sunday thing are their separated daughters. That's interesting wording when you compare it to Scripture and prophecy. Wikipedia. Talking about the Ten Commandments. Until the second and third century, most Christian groups kept the Jewish Sabbath 
Uh huh. Whoa, whoa. Stop there for a moment. Nowhere in the New Testament does it call the Sabbath the Jewish Sabbath. There are some paraphrases that put that in, but not in the original text. Okay? So, with the practice of Sunday observance emerging after the Jewish Roman Wars, the Catholic Church's general repudiation of Jewish practices during this period is apparent in the Council of Laodicea, 4th century AD, where Canon 29 of the Laodicean Council specifically refers to the Sabbath. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's Day, and if, if they can, then resting as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema for Christ or excommunicated. So look at what was happening. Jewish-Roman wars in Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD, all right, as a part of those Jewish-Roman wars. In the days of Jesus, if you're Jewish, the Roman Empire gave you special religious liberties. You did not have to burn incense to the emperor, which was considered a form of worship, and many Jews would die before they would do it. They were given some special religious liberty. Then, Christians came along, and they were kind of grandfathered in. They got that religious liberty with the Jews. But then the Jews revolted against Rome. And instead of getting special religious liberty, they got special punishments. Like, you're not allowed to live in Jerusalem, Rome, or any provincial capital if you're Jewish. And Christians were considered <coughs> following Jesus, a Jewish teacher. They were following the Bible and the same holy book as the Jews. So, hey, they're worshiping on the same day. They have the same holy book. They're following a Jewish teacher. They're Jews. And you had Christians that say, no, we're not. And they said, well, prove it. And you were having a discussion between the bishops of Alexandria and the bishops of Rome and on who was the most important. Those are both provincial capitals. And these guys were looking for power, not getting moved out. And so they, Alexandria and Rome became the primary early spots that they switched from Sabbath to Sunday after the fall of Jerusalem. And then by the time you get to the 4th century, they're passing laws trying to force it. And they're saying, if you follow the Bible Sabbath, you're a Judaizer and we're going to kick you out of the church and you're going to be lost. You lose your salvation. So you follow the Bible, you lose your salvation, according to the church. Well, that's an interesting one. They're pretty desperate to get their way through, aren't they? I would actually say follow the Bible is a better path to salvation than it rejecting the Bible. Here's another one. Fourth century Gentile Christians, like Fredrickson, despite the anti-Jewish ideology of their own bishops, kept Saturdays as their day of rest. Under his Constantine regime, Sunday became the Christian Sabbath. Constantine jammed paganism and Christianity together and made Sunday a legal day of worship with penalties for not obeying. And so that's the fourth century. Here's Constantine's coin. He knew what he was doing. He took the pagan sun burst and the cross and he unites them and there's the sun god in the middle 80 percent of his kingdom was pagan 20 percent were christian ah he just jammed them together notice the pagans get the majority of the coin let's go back to where we ended last night islam attacks papal-led christianity papacy in the u.s conquer radical islam that leaves them in control. All the world follows the beast. I am suggesting that Sunday worship would become the sign of allegiance to Christianity. That's what it was in the past. You either do it our way or we excommunicate you. They killed a lot of people over that issue. Could it be that they would try and enforce Sunday keeping in the world today? You don't have to guess. It's official. They've already said it. Mm -hmm. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Cardinal Rat, excuse me, Cardinal Ratzinger was the one that put this book together. You might know Cardinal Ratzinger by another name, Pope Benedict. All right. 
So Pope Benedict is the writer of this. Now remember, God's got a lot of people within the Catholic system that he calls his people in Revelation 18.4. But he's going to be calling them to come out. And I think the time has pre come pretty close to its th that time. Because this last conflict has begun. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sunday and the church's holy days as legal holidays. They want to go back to Constantine and have the governments force their day of worship. I just realized I forgot to put a quote in here. I'll tell you about it later. Uh, five years ago, there was a papal encyclical. There was another one that came out this last week. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves and with others, and with the world. It protects human action from becoming empty activism. It also prevents that unfettered greed and sense of isolation which makes us seek personal gain to the detriment of all else. The law of the weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day. Oh, man, they're still coming back to that, aren't they? The, the article I forgot to put in is from Crisis Magazine. It's a Catholic magazine. And in it, they are calling for a return to Sunday laws to bring back sanity in the COVID politically disturbed world. Why? Because of the combined assault of Islam and the political left. That's the quote I forgot to put back in here. Sorry about that. Come tomorrow at 6 o'clock and you'll see it there. <laughs> they tried back in 2010 in, in Europe. In the European Union, they tried to get Sunday. And they're getting individual laws, but they tried to get Sunday in as a day of rest for the whole European Union. And they're making it in smaller pieces now. But remember what Jesus said, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Boy, keep that in mind. It's repeated in Mark 7. In vain. I want to worship God effectively. Which means, if we're going to be true followers of God, we really need to be digging into the Bible and follow what it says. That's what we really have to follow. So is this just a Seventh-day Adventist thing, or is it from the Bible? That's the question you really need to ask, because it's just a Seventh-day Adventist thing. You can ignore it. But if it's from the Bible, you better take it seriously. Do you know what the good news is? God knows our hearts. Do you know what the bad news is? God knows our hearts. We've got to be honest with him if we're following him. Well... Where did this teaching come from? It came over 200 years before there was a Seventh-day Adventist church, at least the teaching that the mark of the beast is could be related to Sunday keeping at the end when it becomes an issue. The Sabbath has been there since Genesis, so it's been there since creation. But take a look at this. This book, written in 1657 by a guy by the name of Thomas Tillam, a minister of the gospel, the seventh-day Sabbath sought out and celebrated or the saints' last design upon the man of sin with their advance of God's first institution to its primitive perfection being a clear discovery of the black character in the head of the little horn, Daniel 7.25, the change of times and laws. With the Christian's glorious conquest over the mark of the beast and the recovery of the long-sighted seventh day to its ancient glory, mer mer where Mr. Aspinwall may receive full answer to his late piece against the Sabbath. It's like a book report on the cover page. Uh, that's a fairly rare book. They were destroyed by both Protestants and Catholics. If you want one, I, a few years back, I heard of one for sale for $18,000. I think it's about, I don't remember, I think it's around 150 or a little more than 150 pages long. If you'd like to read it, I know where you can read one for free. On my website on the resources page, I've got a PDF of the book. And uh, if you want to read it, you need to know something. You need to know how to read English, Old English. 
Take a close look. See the saint's last design upon the man of sin? That's not laughed, divine, or thin. An S can look like an S, or it can look like an F, like in last, or sin. Aren't you glad they fixed that and it made S's always look like S's now? But if there are too many F's, it's because it's an F. I mean, if too many F's, it's because it's an S. But if you take a careful look at that, you're going to see something interesting. Think about this for a moment. The papal coin I showed you the other day. Remember Revelation 17 has this woman holding a cup full of abominations, which are teachings that have been corrupted, false teachings. Look what's in the cup. A sunrise, which Ezekiel calls worshiping toward the rising sun, the greater abomination, and they replace the Sabbath with the day of the sun. Now go back to this page. Do you see the cup? Way back in the 1600s, he was talking about Revelation 17 and the lady with a cup full of abominations being worshiping on the first day of the week, and he links it to the mark of the beast. There's the cup, there's the saucer, and there's something over it, just like that coin, a cup with the sun. One is to challenge the papacy. The other one is the one the papacy uses to cover themselves. I mean, that they came up with the art themselves. Now, God's seal, remember, name, territory, title, but it's really a test of love and loyalty. Will we be true to him or will we follow the beast system? Everybody has to choose, and the day of worship shows which side we're on. Jesus said it this way, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Somebody says, Oh, Tim, yeah, the Holy Spirit's the seal of God. It is. So is the Sabbath the seal of God. But get this. It tells me that the Holy Spirit is connected and given to those who are keeping the commandments of God. But in Revelation, the beast has a counterfeit spirit and a counterfeit day. So make sure you're really following God, because if you're not definitely following God and you know you're not following something in here, you're cutting corners somewhere, you're in big trouble. Follow Jesus and the Bible. Jesus goes on, he who does not love me, he will not keep my words. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you don't love me, don't bother. Keeping God's commandments without love for Jesus will not save you either. You've got to have Jesus. That's the simple truth about it. Somebody says, well, Tim, what about people that didn't know anything about the Bible Sabbath? They worshiped on Sunday all their lives, and they thought they were worshiping according to the Bible. <laughs> Good news. Acts 17, verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. God knows our hearts. He knows the difference between willful and ignorant sin. If somebody thinks they're serving God, thankfully, God overlooks that. The Bible said so. But if I know the truth and I reject it and follow the lie anyway, God knows that too. That's why I say the good news is God knows your heart. The bad news is God knows your heart. Now let me tell you a quick story. Yeah, I'm going to have to make it quick. There is a pastor on his way home from church on Sunday. And he's driving down a street, and he sees somebody taking shingles off their house to re-roof their house. I don't know if you've ever done it. It's hard work, especially on a hot day. And so this guy's up there working away, and the pastor sees him. And he thinks, man, that guy's working way too hard for a Sunday. Gets out of his car, walks over there, and says, brother, don't you know you're not supposed to be working on the Lord's Day? And the guy on the roof decides this could be fun. He's going to play with the guy, the pastor. He said, really? I'm not supposed to be working today? 
Pastor says, no, you're not supposed to be working the day. He said, how do you know I'm not supposed to be working the day, Pastor? He says, the pastor, pastor says, it says in the Bible you're not supposed to be working the day. Guy in the roof says, well, I believe the Bible. If you can show me where it says I'm not supposed to work today, I'll quit right now. Pastor thinks this is going to be easy. He goes over to his car. He grabs his Bible, flips open the Exodus 20, and reads the Sabbath commandment that you nor your son nor your manservant nor your maidservant nor your stranger within your gates. Nobody's supposed to be working in your house. And, sir, you're working. The guy says, well, I do believe the Bible. Could you read that to me again? I just want to make sure about it. And so he reads it again. And partway through, the guy in the room said, whoa, whoa, stop, stop, stop. Didn't that say seventh day? Wasn't that yesterday? The pastor looks in his Bible, looks back and forth, looks at the verses around, realizes it does say seventh day, looks at the guy on the roof and says, it does say seventh day, doesn't it? The pastor knew where the verse was, but it never connected in his brain before. The guy on the roof scrambles down the ladder because he actually was a Sabbath-keeping Christian. Like I said, he was just playing along with it, see where it was going to go. He says, come on in the house. He says, I want to show, show you a whole bunch of other verses. So they go in the house, and they have a Bible study on this topic. And the pastor makes this decision. I've always followed Jesus in the Bible, and I'm not going to change now. That is, he's not going to stop following Jesus in the Bible. So he changed the day of worship he worships on. Because he's always followed Jesus in the Bible. And he's going to keep doing that. Is he any more saved before or after? Nope. Because he was completely surrendered to Jesus Christ before and after. But now let's play it a different way. What if he learns what the Bible says and he says, God, I'm not going to follow you on this one. Now he's in trouble, isn't he? Rebellion is a serious issue. God overlooked ignorant sin. He does not overlook willful sin. Now, everybody has to choose one side or the other. Back to Islam and Christianity. They have a conflict over Jerusalem and Israel, right? And that place represents God's people. But the day of worship for God's Israel has always been the seventh-day Sabbath. But the king of the north didn't want to be called Israelite or Jewish, so he changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. The king of the south didn't want to be called Israelite or Jewish, so he changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Friday. Did you just notice something? If you're a Sabbath-keeping Christian, you just got caught in the middle all over the world. The day of worship is already a sign of which side you're on. And right now, we already have a conflict going between Papal Sunday and Islamist Friday, the radicals. They're already in a conflict. And Sunday's going to take down Friday, and then Sunday goes after Sabbath keepers. Because the king of the north wants to control the world. But he's the counterfeit king. And when he goes after God's people, we're going to find out that Michael stands up and God puts an end to the king of the north. That is good news. When it looks at the very darkest, God rescues his people. So we have this third conflict opens up an opportunity to share the gospel and Bible truth like never before. Satan gets angry, goes out to destroy God's people, and God saves his people. It's time to be serious, because we're already into this. And it's supposed to be relatively short. Third conflict, loud cry, it's short, and, radical, and then the papal system goes down. I'm glad to be living in these exciting times. I'm glad to be able to share Bible truth with people. And I just encourage you, dig into the Bible, love it, share it with everybody, and use it as your guide for life. Revelation said, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. 
sins and iniquities are based on breaking God's law. And this is a system that chose to refuse to keep the one commandment that God said, remember. They changed that one that God said is a sign that he makes us holy. And they said, no, no, God doesn't make us holy. You go to the priest and he forgives you. God has to do what the priest says. Friends, no church saves you. Only Jesus saves you. I'd suggest following Jesus' words, his Bible, not the traditions of any church. Hebrews says, and let us consider, consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sin. We're supposed to be encouraging each other. I'm not trying to get you mad. I am trying to encourage you to follow God's word. There's nothing safer than following God's word. And that's where I wish for all of you. And remember, there's not a burden in it. You see, it's not a burden to have 52 extra days of vacation every year. From sundown Friday to sundown Saturday night. No regular work. A time to spend time in fellowship with God, fellowship with believers, getting to know your family a little bit better, exploring God's creation and helping other people and sharing God's truth. Those are all good things, but we're so busy so much of the time that we don't get it done. And God says, just stop the wild merry-go-round, have 24 hours to be sane, and remember that he loves you and he's the boss. It's a wonderful way of staying sane in this crazy world. And as his, Jesus' custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read and was teaching them on the Sabbath. Jesus kept the seventh-day Sabbath. And as a Christian, we should be following the examples of Jesus. Paul followed the example with Jews and Gentiles, and I'm encouraging each of us to do the same. Our next presentation is when Michael stands up. And uh, in that, let me just say it this way. If I've irritated any of you with the Sabbath thing, you're going to love the next one, even if you got irritated with me tonight. Uh, this is how God begins to rescue his people. From Daniel 12:1 onward, it's all about God rescuing his people. But he rescues us not only at the time of the end, but he rescues us from false teachings in the process. And so it's an exciting rescue. And we begin that tomorrow evening with the topic of when Michael stands up. Again, tomorrow evening, we also have uh, a question and answer period from 8.30 to 9.00. And I hope you'll be able to give me some questions, write them out on the back of your response envelopes, hand them to me out in the foyer tonight, and I will have those things. Hopefully, I'll have an answer figured out for each of the questions that come in. If not, I'll take hands or people can email questions in to us or on the chat, however, to get questions into us. And then, if I don't have questions, we'll have a shorter than half hour period. If we have too many, I'll still stop at half an hour. Our response envelope tonight, if you can pull that envelope out. Uh, statement number one tonight, you just respond on your opinion, yes, no, or question. Eventually, everyone will have to choose sides by accepting God's seal or Satan's mark. Everyone has to choose sides by accepting God's seal or Satan's mark. Number two, according to the Bible, the Sabbath is a sign that God makes us holy. Is it true that according to the Bible, the Sabbath is a sign that God makes us holy? Number three, the seventh day was the Sabbath of Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church, God's Israel of faith. Yes, no, or question mark. And number four, the papacy, the king of the north, claims it changed the day of worship to Sunday, while Islam, the king of the south, changed the primary day of Islamic prayer to Friday, and the sermon, by the way, is there too. Both made the change for anti-Jewish, anti-Israel reasons. Is it true that they both have a change day. And number five, yes, no, or you're not sure, question mark, because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and God's last day followers in Revelation keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus, then God's followers should keep all ten of God's commandments, including the seventh-day Sabbath. 
Do you see that God would want you to do that? If so, put a yes down on there. If you think the answer is no, you do that. Or if you're not sure yet, you need to study it, put a question mark. And again, question and answer. Tomorrow night at 8.30 and when Michael stands up at 7.30. And, oh, that's one of the fun ones too. I enjoy that presentation. Let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us forgiveness, that you make us holy, and that we can trust in your holiness and your works, knowing that we're forgiven from ours. Help us to love people and never think we're better than anybody else because we all need the same forgiveness. We all need the same change of your spirit changing us from the inside out. And Lord, I ask that you gather us together as your people. Enliven our interest, our pour your spirit out so that we'll actually reach out and share these truths in your love with others. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.